Our next speaker is Dr. Annette Litster. She's director of the Maddie Shelter Medicine Program at Purdue University School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Litster graduated from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia in 1982 and became a registered specialist in feline medicine in 2001 after sex successfully completing a fellowship of the Australian College of Veterinary Scientists by examination. She was awarded a PhD in 2004 and a Master of Medical Science in Clinical Epidemiology in 2006. Dr. Litster has recently completed a major study on the prevalence of protective antibody titers to canine parvovirus and distemper virus and the response of dogs to modified live vaccination um, at Paul's Chicago and at the Humane Society of Indianapolis. Um, Dr. Litster's uh, session is sponsored by uh, Merck Animal Health, so I would like uh, to really uh, recognize them and thank them for uh, their sponsorship of um, this talk. Dr. Litster. Thank you very much, Cinder, and thank you very much to our sponsors and also to the Maddie's Fund and to the University of Florida Maddie Shoulder Medicine Program, who have been just wonderful colleagues, friends, and a constant source of inspiration to me and I'm sure to everyone here in this audience. So I'll just give you a little outline of my presentation. I'm going to start with some background information just setting you up for our study that we did at Purdue uh, last year during the summer. We'll go through the recommended vaccines for shelter dogs, what the different kinds of vaccines are and their advantages, disadvantages, possible causes of vaccine failure, things that you don't want to do, do what I say, not what I do perhaps, uh, protection by vaccines in an outbreak, what can we expect? And then uh, we'll uh, learn about the uh, major project that we went through last summer assessing vaccine response in shelter dogs. So our core vaccine for shelter dogs are distemper, hepatitis, parvovirus, parainfluenza, Bordetella, generally uh, we recommend that a combination of intranasal and also modified live Bordetella vaccine is given. Intranasal perhaps give that first since it has a, a fast onset of action. And uh, it's a good idea to start puppies in shelters as early as four weeks of age, four to six weeks of age, then vaccinate every two to four weeks until they're 16 to 18 weeks. Adults are vaccinated always on intake, and if you can vaccinate those animals even before intake, perhaps you've got a program where owners are giving you some kind of warning that they're going to relinquish animals to your shelter, you might have them on a waiting list. It's a good idea to make sure those animals are vaccinated before you actually accept them into your shelter. If they just turn up on your doorstep, if you can vaccinate them even in the car park, but just vaccinate them as soon as possible, that should be the first thing that you do to protect the health of your population. If you still have them with you two to four weeks later, of course, vaccinate them again. Rabies is a quasi-core vaccine. Um, as you know, Shelters are not a high risk environment for rabies transmission. So a lot of shelters with limited resources are unable to uh, give rabies vaccines unless those animals are expected to stay with them for the longer term. Uh, so that's what makes it a quasi core vaccine. And then a non-core vaccine that really has particular interest to us as shelter veterinarians is the canine influenza virus vaccine and that is a killed vaccine and it is uh, recommended for use wherever there is endemic situation where we know that we have a high risk situation 
or where there is transport between shelters from endemic uh, areas. So I drew this cartoon just to explain a little to you about how vaccines are made. And um, we start off here with our live virus. You can see there's some genetic material there. And uh, that, that is what makes that virus replicate. And these purple dots on the outside are what's known as epitopes. Uh, they are also responsible for stimulating an immune reaction from the host. And uh, vaccine manufacturers take this live virus and they manipulate it in a number of different ways in order to make different kinds of vaccines that have different qualities for us to choose from. So there is inactivated or killed virus vaccine where the DNA or RNA from that virus has been completely killed, it's inactivated. Modified live vaccine, the DNA or RNA is still in there, but it's in a modified and severely weakened form. So when we give a modified live vaccine, we are in fact giving an infection with that particular infectious agent but it is a very much attenuated infection. Uh, more recently, there have been purified subunit vaccines where they've been taking these epitopes from live virus and using them to stimulate an immune response that is protective. There's gene-deleted vaccines where they take the genetic material out uh, so that that a uh, virus can't replicate anymore, but it still has the epitopes on the outside of the virus particle to stimulate an immune response. And then a lot of you will have heard and used live virus uh, vectored vaccines where you're taking a, another kind of virus that is not pathogenic to the animal that you're interested in, in this case a dog, perhaps it's canary pox for instance, Canary pox can cause an infection in dogs, but it doesn't cause clinical signs. So we combine the canary pox with the um, DNA or RNA of the virus that we're interested in uh, getting protection from, and we make a live virus uh, vectored vaccine. So this table, it's rather busy, but I'll just hit the take home messages for from it. We've got three different columns here, killed vaccine, modified live vaccine and recombinant vaccines and each of these have different features that might be used to our advantage in different situations. So the onset of protection in modified live vaccine or uh, recombinant vaccines is much faster than in killed vaccines. So in an animal that does not have um, maternal immunity to uh, block the vaccine, a single dose of modified live vaccine is an immunising dose. It will be protective. However, if you use a killed vaccine in that same animal, you're going to need two doses in order to achieve protection. So that's really going to slow things up. The first dose is a priming dose, and then the second dose is an immunising dose. And you're not getting protection until a week after the second dose. Now, we're talking a few weeks here, maybe three to five weeks before we get full protection. Three to five weeks is an awful long time in a lot of shelters. So for speed of protection alone, I think most shelters are choosing modified live vaccines. We're also interested in safety, of course, and killed vaccines may be slow, but they are safe. So uh, we do have to watch out for potential problems, if we, especially if we use a vaccine by the wrong route with modified live vaccines. I don't know if any of you have ever had problems where a Bordetella bronchoseptica vaccine that is meant for intranasal use has been given subcutaneously. That can cause really um, bad liver problems in the, um, in the dogs that, uh, that are affected. 
and you've really got to make sure that you use the vaccine exactly as recommended because if you don't use that uh, exactly as recommended, there can be really quite severe side effects. Modified live vaccines can also um, cause problems in pregnant animals, especially with diseases that can cause um, neonatal infections such as canine parvovirus and of course feline panleukopenia virus. And this is why we don't recommend even in a shelter situation that you start vaccinating before the age of four weeks. Uh, there can also be a problem with dogs with uh, reactivation of immune mediated disease uh, that is stimulated by vaccination immune mediated hemolytic anemia can happen associated with vaccination in dogs. Uh, that's a rare event and I think certainly in a shelter population, the risk of actual infection with these uh, infectious agents that are so common in shelters is much higher than the risk of immune mediated hemolytic anemia. So really the IMHA is a problem for uh, the private practice world much more so than for the shelter world. Um, with the recombinant vaccines, a reversion to virulence is not so much of a problem, and, um, but it can be associated with IMHA just the same as modified live vaccinations. As far as maternal antibody interference goes, and that's a big problem in shelters where we're accepting lots of puppies in all the time of unknown vaccination status for both the puppies and for their mothers. Um, it is possible for that to happen uh, with killed vaccine, but it, it's less likely in dogs that are over that 12 week mark, of course. As long as you give a dog that um, is over 14 to 16 weeks of age modified live vaccine, you can be pretty sure that there is not going to be any maternal antibody interference. Recombinant vaccines can have some advantages here, especially with canine distemper virus. And uh, some people do choose to use recombinant vaccines in their puppy population for this particular reason. Storage and uh, stability are also very important because we've paid good money, hard won money for vaccines and we wanna make sure that we're getting what we paid for. Killed vaccines are pretty tolerant. Yes, we should always follow the manufacturer's instructions, but they are more tolerant than modified live vaccines. We need to make sure that that living organism stays alive because that's the only way it can work for us. And um, we really do need to use that vaccine, if possible, within an hour of reconstitution. We don't want to get organised for the whole morning and reconstitute all our vaccines for the whole morning and then two or three hours later, we're still doing the last few puppies. Um, the vaccine's just not going to work properly if we do that. And certainly with modified live vaccines, two or three hours after it's reconstituted, really uh, you can't expect too much of it. So you've got to keep it um, refrigerated and you've got to absolutely observe a time limit after you've reconstituted that vaccine. The cost of vaccines is always a big issue. Recombinant vaccines are modern technology and they have some advantages that I was telling you about earlier, but they are more expensive than modified live vaccines or killed vaccines. All of these things, the onset of protection, the safety, the stability and maternal antibody interference, they're all part of the equation that we've got to weigh up the pros and cons for our own particular shelter situation, for the dogs that we bring into our shelter. Are we in an endemic area for parvovirus, for instance? Is distemper a real problem in our particular area? Um, also, are we transferring from endemic areas? All of these things go into the equation. We have to, to weigh up benefits and risks. 
So we want to know how, what are the causes of failure so that we can avoid vaccine failure. As I said, we want to make sure that we make every post a winner. Um, the most common reason that vaccines don't work in shelters is that animals came into our shelter already incubating that particular infectious disease. And there's not a lot that we can do about that sometimes. Uh, so I, I'm not saying don't vaccinate, of course. The only hope they've got is vaccination. But we don't need to really um, self-flagellate too much because sometimes the problem is, is not of our making. Often uh, these diseases are in the incubation phase when we're admitting the puppies into our shelters. Interference. We know about maternal antibody interference. There can also be interference if you give a vaccine too often. So a lot of, vaccine, a lot of shelters, including the shelters that I'm associated with in the Midwest, do vaccinate every two weeks. But every two weeks is the most frequently that you should be vaccinating because um, if you vaccinate more frequently than that, then that second vaccine may inter the first vaccine may interfere with the response to the second vaccine because of the antibody titer that was stimulated from the first vaccine. Improper storage. It is really well worthwhile your time to take out the manufacturer's instruction leaflet when you buy a new batch of vaccines and just spend the five minutes reading those instructions. You can't expect these um, vaccines to work unless you follow them, the manufacturer's instructions exactly. It only takes five minutes to read the leaflet and it's well worth doing. You've got to make sure that your refrigeration uh, is optimal and that um, you're not keeping modified live vaccines in the freezer compartment, of course, uh, because you're going to kill that infectious agent. They're not supposed to be kept in the freezer. Those ones go in the refrigerator. And as I said earlier, you should be discarding any vaccines if they are still um, sitting around on your countertop after two hours after they've been reconstituted. You should always use just one vaccine uh, per syringe and needle, single use, of course, and always use the diluent provided by the manufacturer. That's really not uh, a corner worth cutting. You need to make sure that the vaccine and the diluent go together. They're made to go together if you want to achieve the results that you're hoping for. So there can be administration problems with the wrong route, as I told you earlier about um, Bordetella bronchoseptica is the one that we uh, think of the most often with dogs. And if that does happen to you, often people will try uh, locally instilled gentamicin in a saline infusion and oral doxycycline. You should also contact the vaccine manufacturer. There's a lot of talk about uh, which, uh, which place you give cat vaccines, but we don't have any specific guidelines at this stage for giving dog vaccines. Um, this talk was based on the very uh, latest information from the AHA 2011 uh, canine vaccine guidelines. And what that document tells us is that you should administer rabies vaccine on, on the shoulder and uh, you, you should also make a note of uh, exactly where you have administered any vaccines. So there's not set guidelines like there are for cats yet, but just really some suggestions just in case problems occur later on. Spillage. We, we encourage you to clean up any countertops if there's spillage on countertops uh, with a 1 in 32 bleach solution. If the spillage on the fur after you've administered the subcutaneous vaccine, then you clean that up with alcohol. You shouldn't be swabbing 
before you administer a modified live vaccine because as the needle goes through the skin, it may take up a little bit of the alcohol and kill that virus that's in the modified live vaccine. So this is one case where you should swab afterwards. So what can we expect in an outbreak situation from vaccination? Firstly, with canine parvovirus, we know that immunity develops pretty quickly in uh, two to seven days after an effective modified live or recombinant vaccine. And uh, we also know that if you're managing the population in an outbreak, you can put into the low risk population any dogs that are over four, four months of age and also have been vaccinated with modified live vaccine at least one to two weeks prior to exposure to uh, canine parvovirus. If you're doubtful, has this dog perhaps got uh, parvovirus? Is it just diarrhea from some other cause? Of course, um, make a blood smear, put together uh, some information to see whether you're looking at parvovirus perhaps or not. But you, you should be able to put that uh, older puppy or adult dog that has been immunised one to two weeks earlier with modified live vaccine into a low risk population. As I said earlier, um, maternal antibodies can interfere with vaccination from the age of seven weeks to 15 weeks, those, the maternal antibody level is dropping off. But um, we, we know that after about five months of age, it doesn't really interfere with our vaccine response. Modified live vaccines can also produce some false no, um, positives with canine parvovirus fecal antigen tests. That can happen uh, three to 14 days after a modified live vaccine, so just be aware of that. They tend to be weak positive results and uh, they also tend to be pretty test brand dependent. Um, some uh, studies have shown that they're more likely to happen with the symbiotics witness test. With canine distemper virus, challenge studies have shown a really incredibly fast response to a modified live vaccine or recombinant vaccine uh, within four hours of a, an effective vaccine, those dogs are protected provided there's not a problem with maternal immunity, those dogs are protected from the really severe neurological effects of a challenge with canine distemper. There's complete uh, protection in seven days after vaccination from the challenge studies that have been published. Bordetella, uh, the intranasal vaccine, as I said earlier, tends to have a rapid onset of action in two to three days. And it can also be used in very young puppies of uh, two to three weeks of age because it does tend to get over the maternal immunity problem better than other types of vaccines, such as modified live vaccine. Canine para-influenza um, and also um, the hepatitis vaccine has a rapid onset of immunity in one to five days. So we'll move on to our canine vaccine research that was done last uh, summer of last year uh, at two of our partner shelters in our Purdue Maddie Shelter Medicine Program, uh, Poor Chicago and the Humane Society of Indianapolis. So we aimed to determine the parvovirus and distemper virus antibody test status of dogs that had no known history of vaccination at the time of shelter admission. And we wanted to document that antibody response over a two week period by testing each week. We used two study locations, as I said, Poor Chicago and Humane Society of Indianapolis. Now, the setup for the study was slightly different at each of the two locations 
Paws Chicago is one of the largest adoption guarantee shelters in the Midwest. Uh, some of you may have visited it and um, it accepts most of its incoming dogs from the local municipal shelter, which is a mile down the road, Chicago Animal Care and Control. So we were able to have access to the dogs as they were coming into Port Chicago, and we were particularly interested in dogs that were four to 24 months of age. So they were old enough that maternal immunity wasn't going to be a confounder in our study because we were studying antibody protection levels. And also, they were still young enough that they were young dogs that were our uh, at-risk population. So these dogs originally came into Chicago Animal Care and Control where they should have received a modified live vaccine for distemper and parvovirus on intake. Then after a period of five days, then we uh, were able to bring them into Port Chicago and we started the study then. So that was the setup for Poor Chicago. <coughs> for the Humane Society of Indianapolis, it was slightly different. So Humane Society of Indianapolis is a limited admission shelter. They do have quite a few walk-up uh, stray animals as well as uh, animals that they're getting from the local um, animal care and control and from other shelters that are transfers. So um, the en enrolment criteria for the dogs at Humane Society of Indianapolis was any dog that when the person brought it in, that dog had no known history of vaccination. So there were quite a few stray dogs in there. There certainly weren't transfers from other shelters. And in order to get the numbers that we needed, we just opened it up to any dogs that were over the age of four months of age. So what we did was collect sera from these dogs at three time points. So firstly, on the day of enrolment, before they were vaccinated at either Poor Chicago or at the Humane Society of Indianapolis. And then we got results from those dogs using a point of care test, which was a Symbiotics, Titer Check, uh, Parvo and Distemper test. And uh, any dogs that were not protected on the day of enrolment before they were vaccinated then we followed up with those dogs at day six to eight. We again repeated that uh, titer check test and any dogs that were still not protected on the titer check test, we followed up again at uh, day 13 to 15. At the conclusion of the study, we had uh, saved Sierra and frozen it at minus 80 so that we could submit duplicate sera to a reference lab, and in this case it was at Cornell, and they did gold standard testing so that we could compare our uh, symbiotics titer check test results against the gold standard testing that was done at Cornell. And symbiotics labs also received some duplicate samples as well so that they could see what results that they got in uh, their own laboratory conditions. So many of you, do any of you use the Symbiotics Titer Check or other brands of point of care antibody tests in your shelters? Show of hands. Some, of, some people do. Um, so Dr. Schultz uh, has, um, has done some really wonderful presentations at the Maddie's Institute on uh, antibody testing to save lives, and I would really encourage you to have a look at those presentations uh, at, at the Maddie's Institute site. It tells you how to use um, antibody testing so that you can manage your population and uh, save lives in doing so. This is what a symbiotics titer check test looks like. It's a number of different wells. The ones here that are red, uh, they're for parvovirus, and the ones in white are for distemper virus. And at either end, these first two wells here at the left and the last two wells at the right, 
they are control wells. So those are designed to be positive and we're going to compare our uh, samples with those positive controls. We also had a negative control well, which is the second one from the left there. And this is our data collection sheet there. We made a photographic record of all of our test results so that we could compare the colours. So, our ages, as I said earlier, poor Chicago, they were dogs that had come from Chicago Animal Care and Control. They were four to 24 months of age. At Humane Society of Indi Indianapolis, they ended up being five months to 12 years of age, these dogs with no known history of vaccination. And when we combined all of those dogs and looked at their test results at the time of enrolment, we found that older dogs tended to have positive test results more frequently than younger dogs. And I suppose that's no surprise to you because you would tend to think that perhaps older dogs have perhaps received vaccination before. We looked at the effect of gender and source and I'll just take you through this table uh, first. So we have these two columns here are for poor Chicago and there were 51 dogs in that group and these two columns on the right are for Humane Society of Indianapolis and I have just highlighted in blue any results of particular interest and you can see here that if these animals were spayed females or neutered males for parvovirus at both sites there was 100% protection from the dogs that we sampled. Uh, for uh, distemper virus, uh, there was 80% protection in the neutered males from poor Chicago, but otherwise uh, there was 100% protection at Humane Society of Indianapolis. So if you're taking dogs into a shelter that are already spayed or neutered, from this population, you'd think that there was a higher chance that they may already be protected against uh, distemper and parvovirus, perhaps. Owner relinquished and or transferred animals as well, uh, compared to strays on this second last row. You can see there was a, a large number at Humane Society of Indianapolis where we had a wide age range there and also sometimes owners that had been on a waiting list to get their, own, their dogs in. Uh, there was 94.1% of them that were protected against parvovirus. So um, in the other site at poor Chicago, there didn't seem to be as much of a difference between stray animals and owner relinquished or transferred animals. And uh, I'll just present a few graphs here now. So there is um, poor Chicago are the bars in blue and Humane Society of Indianapolis are the bars in red. And we're looking at the antibody response to modified live vaccine over the course of our two week study. And this is the percentage of the dogs in the study that were protected using this symbiotics titer check test. They received a positive um, titer check test result for parvovirus. You can see that there were about two thirds of them protected at uh, poor Chicago, a few more than that at Humane Society of Indianapolis, and that response to vaccination with modified live vaccine for parvovirus was pretty well done inside seven days, just confirming what we know from the published literature. Pretty well all of them except for one uh, by 13, day 13 to day 15 did have a positive test result. Same kind of graph, this time for distemper virus. And you can see here that the, the initial protection status for distemper virus was much lower than it was for parvovirus. It was about a third of dogs were protected, whereas it was more like two thirds of dogs were coming in protected for parvovirus. Also, the response to the vaccination was a bit slower than for parvovirus. 
there was there was much more of a of a gentle gradient there, and um, they were pretty well all protected though after two weeks. So just to discuss the results that we received, more dogs tested positive at intake for parvovirus than for distemper. And we think that there may be perhaps differences in local prevalence of these two different diseases. I know there is a lot of distemper virus down here in the southwest. We don't see very much distemper virus in the Midwest, we see quite a bit of parvovirus. We see a lot more panleukopenia even. Uh, so there, there can be difference, differences in local prevalence of disease. Also, it's just the nature of the way the virus lives in the environment. We all know how difficult parvovirus is to kill in the environment. It stays around a long time. Distemper virus is not as long lived in the environment. So the environment kills it off naturally itself, whereas parvovirus, dogs can become infected months later if a really good cleanup job hasn't been done. So maybe um, that is why there were more dogs uh, that already were protected against parvovirus because they'd had some level of exposure to it earlier. So. The older dogs were more likely to be protected probably because of previous history and, you know, they've just had more time to be exposed to these diseases. Spayed and neutered animals were more likely to be protected and if they've been spayed and neutered, they're probably more likely to have been vaccinated as well. So um, that's probably going to explain that finding. We found it interesting that there were similar patterns of protection for stray animals and for owner relinquished or um, transferred animals. And I think this partly may be to do with the nature of dogs themselves. Dogs are not big cats. Uh, we don't tend to have free roaming dogs in the community the way we have free roaming cats in the community. Most dogs like to be with people, and even though they may be stray dogs, it's likely that they were owned by a person, perhaps relatively recently. So if they were owned, then they may have been vaccinated. That may be part of it. Maybe our sample size just wasn't uh, high enough for the statistics to work for us. Maybe we needed to um, sample 1,000 dogs rather than just 100 dogs. So I, I'm all for using tighter testing as a um, in-house tool for population management. Uh, it's, it's a powerful tool that can really save lives. It can help you establish what are low-risk animals and treat them appropriately, what are higher-risk animals and uh, treat them appropriately too. As with any study, there were a number of limitations to this study. One of them was their shelter animals, so the age was estimated. We had a fair idea of the age, but you know nobody brought a, a birth certificate with their dog. So it was um, just estimated on dentition and other things like hair coat, that sort of thing, the same way as you do every day in a shelter. Also, uh, when we had our dogs come into Humane Society of Indianapolis, it was a, an in inclusion criteria was no known history of vaccination. So perhaps even though no one knew about the history of vaccination doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen. So that could have been a factor that could explain some of our results. We should remember that the way these antibody tests work is that if the dog tests positive for that particular test for parvovirus and distemper, we know that that dog is protected against exposure to those, those diseases. If the dog tests negative, it could still be protected. Uh, we know positive means positive, negative could also mean uh, protected as well. And that's because there's not only antibody, um, mediated immunity is very important, but also cell-mediated immunity. And the levels of antibodies 
could decline in concentration over time, but of course there's memory cells that can jolt that dog's immune system into action immediately on any kind of challenge. And that dog's antibody concentration, if it was challenged, that antibody concentration could really jump up within a matter of hours to days. So we've just got to remember that when we're interpreting the test results. There is a natural variability in um, any shelter population and any statistician will tell you that to make statistics work we like a very tight uniform population. We're not going to get that in a shelter so that perhaps did provide some statistical limitations for the analysis of our results. So we just wanted to follow up and do a practical study comparing the results that we got using the tighter check test in shelters with people, you know, I, I'll admit it, I take the prize, the person that was worst at, at doing this test that had to do the most do-overs was me. Uh, I always forgot something or whatever, everybody else seemed to be able to do them quite well but I, I had to keep on repeating them so the shelter results actually include my results as well uh, and you'll be surprised at how good they seem to be but we wanted to compare them with um, the results that we got from Cornell and also the results that we got under laboratory conditions using that same test kit at Symbiotics. So we wanted to know, can we really get good accurate results in a shelter situation? We compare colour changes, as you saw with that slide earlier. Uh, you, you compare different shades of blue. And in the, the test instructions, all you've got to do is compare it with a positive and a negative control well and decide if your test well is positive or negative. In our test, we actually divided the, um, the positive and negative control wells into a number of different shades of blue to see whether that enhanced our accuracy at all. So as I said earlier, we had duplicate and triplicate sera sent to two different places, um, Cornell and to Symbiotics. We used different uh, shades of blue and we also used at Symbiotics Test Lab, they have an optical density reader. So scientists might say to you, well, you know, you're just estimating colour. I want something that is really very objective, not subjective, like a person estimating colour. And an op optical density reader will do that for you. It turns um, particular colours into frequencies and numbers. So I wonder if that really makes a difference to the accuracy of the test reading as well. So our results. Firstly, this slide is all about the accuracy with uh, canine parvovirus first. And we have sensitivity here in this column and then specificity. We had the regular method, which was just what we did uh, in a shelter situation. Dr. Cinder Crawford also recommended that we could try an extra wash method, that maybe by putting an extra wash step in that we would enhance the um, reliability of our results. We had the laboratory performed regular method as well uh, that was done at Symbiotics with a particular one trained laboratory technician that didn't have a lot of other things going on and it was the one person doing all of the testing. And there was also an optical de density um, reading as well so that the machine could tell us what colours that they got. So you can see here that we got excellent results no matter where it was done. The laboratory results didn't seem to be really superior to just even our regular method and the extra wash didn't seem to really enhance the results appreciably either. For distemper virus, you can see the uh, sensitivity of our uh, distemper virus test was a bit lower than the over 90% that we're getting for all of the other test results. 
Uh, they seem to be able to bump this sensitivity up a little bit in the lab at Symbiotics uh, using their optical density meter and their lab technicians, but we sat around the 75-76% uh, mark for sensitivity, but again, um, around the 90% mark for specificity for distemper virus. So uh, we found that reading the colours as seven different shades really didn't do anything to enhance the accuracy of the test. And we also found, as I said earlier, that the uh, sensitivity of the distemper virus testing was lower than the, um, the other diagnostic parameters for the two viruses. But in a way, if you've got to have some parameter that uh, doesn't work as well for you, this is probably a good one to have in a shelter situation because what we don't want is a lot of false positives where we have animals that we think are protected because of the test results that aren't really protected. If our sensitivity is reduced, what that means is that we're not really going to have a problem with those false positive results. Uh, so um, that's better in a, um, a shelter situation. So we can conclude that the um, in-clinic ELISA testing is a really useful tool. It gives good, accurate results, and it helps us to make population management decisions in shelters. And we could use it in practice uh, to assess the need for parvovirus or distemper vaccination as well in owned animals. And with that, I'd be happy to accept any questions. <laughs>